All right, I know it's just me between you and a break, so I'm going to tell you two things. First, I'm going to share our view of the future of commerce, and I'm going to share with you the underlying principles that define that future state, and then I'm going to show you how we're using those principles to actually shape the way that we market to consumers today. So let's start with money. At Visa, it's always been more than money. In fact, our founder, Dehock, said back in 1950, money is not coin, it's not currency, it's not credit cards. What Dee saw, his vision was that we could create digital money that would be a universally accepted global currency. And it's that vision that, born, or that Visa was born from. And so at Visa, it's always been more than money. It's been about a promise. It's been about a promise to offer the best way to pay and be paid for everyone everywhere. It's been a promise of universal acceptance it's been a promise of unsurpassed security, convenience, and value. And that promise has led us to today, and it will guide us into the future. And so when we think of the future and the future of commerce, I think it's important to first reflect on the recent past. So just a little over 10 years ago, if you thought about commerce, there were really just two dimensions. There was the physical dimension and then the digital dimension. If, and if you think back to the way that we as consumers conducted the majority of our transactions, oftentimes you would go online, you'd do research, you'd print out that information, and you'd take that to the physical point of sale, and you'd use it to guide your transaction. And so those two worlds, those, the physical world and the digital world, were just starting to intersect. Back then as consumers, we were consuming about 60 hours of media a week. But a very, very small percent of that were over digital channels, only about 15%. And if you can believe it, mobile penetration was only about 12% back then. And digital commerce as a category was only about 286 billion. Fast forward to today, and you'll see that those two dimensions are now intersecting further, the physical and the digital uh, dimensions. But what's interesting is now the social dimension is adding a whole nother layer of complexity. And we as marketers have to help consumers navigate those three dimensions. Today, our media consumption has jumped up to 75 hours. About 67% of that is now over digital channels. Mobile penetration has jumped to 90%. And digital commerce has grown 4x to about 1.3 trillion. So what does the future look like? When we think about the future, we'll see these three worlds completely converge to this state that we call omnicommerce. And that's going to completely change the way that we as consumers interact with brands, the way we interact with products, the way we interact with ourselves. And as far as we're concerned, it will completely change the way we conduct commerce. Our media consumption will jump up to 90 hours a week, if you can imagine that. And about 75% of that consumption will be over digital channels. Obviously, a lot of that will be happening simultaneously. Mobile penetration will be at nearly 100%. And the digital commerce category will be up to 2 trillion or even more than that. So this is the future state, or how we see the future state of commerce, this idea of omnicommerce. Omnicommerce, in our minds, is the total convergence of commerce against, across those three dimensions, the physical, the digital, and the social, that will create this consumer-centric, intelligent, and seamless consumer payment experience. But rather than just share words, let me show you what three future transaction experiences might look like for consumers around the world.
So that will be the world of omnicommerce. It'll be defined by three principles. The first is intelligent communication, I'm sorry, the first is people powered. So that's people influencing other people. The second principle is intelligent communications. And so that's using data sets to create hyper relevant and engaging content for consumers. And the third is seamless experiences. So really helping consumers navigate across those three dimensions that I just described. So let me just go briefly into all three of these. The first is people powered. As everyone knows, people are becoming increasingly connected, influential, and ultimately powerful as consumers. By 2014, they predict that there'll be about 1.9 social network users around the world. That'll be about 71% of the internet penetration. Most of that growth will come from emerging markets like India, Indonesia, and China. And a lot of those people will be accessing those social networks via mobile devices. In fact, Carolyn, you'll have to keep me honest on this, is the last data I saw is Facebook, which had over 1.1 billion users, about 680 million of those were accessing Facebook through a mobile device. So I don't know if that's close enough, but it's a big, outstanding number. But it's not just about the scale and the scope of the social networks, it's what they're doing with it. If you look at a recent US study, we know that 60% of consumers are writing product and service reviews and sharing those across their social graph. Google just released a, a new study called Generation C, and they say that 55% of Generation C consumers actually do some sort of comparison checking using a mobile device at least once a week. 33% of that same target do it one to three times a week. And then if you look at what global consumers are saying, they're saying 92% of those global consumers are saying, I actually trust those re reviews, and they actually motivate me to take action. And if you look at what they're doing in terms of doing those, those checks beforehand, I think it's about 57% say that they check what their peers say before they actually buy. And again, citing that new Google study, the Generation C, they're saying that could be as high as 85% among that segment that they've tested. And so what do we need to do as marketers? What we need to do is first just embrace the fact that there's been a huge shift in power, and it now actually sits in the hands of consumers. And we have to look at the consumer decision journey, this idea that consumers consider, evaluate, buy, and then advocate, and find ways to insert ourselves into that consumer decision journey with relevant content to shape them into advocates. So that's principle number one. The second principle is around this idea of intelligent communications. And in fact, Franz just talked about this as well in terms of you know, consumers are relying on these vast data sets to shape the way that they consume things, the way that they conduct transactions. And we as marketers and as merchants and as financial institutions need to stay up with what consumers are doing. Just think about mobile again. 6.5 billion mobile subscribers in the world today. About 1.2 billion people access the internet via some sort of mobile device. And what are they doing? Well, they're searching. About 620 million search queries per day, every day around the world. And what those queries are leading to are actions. We also know from research that the majority of those consumers, when doing a mobile search query, take some form of action. It might be a call, it might be an email, it might be a store visit. Ideally, it would be a transaction. It could be just about sharing information across their social graph. And so we need to understand the power of mobile that consumers now hold in their hand. And again, sort of connecting back to what Franz said is, what we also know is they're wielding that mobile device as a tool to make those decisions when they're actually at the physical point of sale. In fact, 73% of consumers, and this is amazing to me, they'd rather use their device to conduct basic in-store tasks than actually dealing with a sales clerk. And so they want to bypass the whole P2P portion of sales within a physical environment. And we also know that if a consumer leaves a store without conducting a transaction, Oftentimes, it's because of some sort of action that they took on their mobile device. In fact, 39% of what they call transaction abandonment is related to some sort of action that took place on a mobile device. So again, the importance of that device and what we do with it and how we feed information to consumers is critical. Lastly, the retail establishments know this. They know that consumers have this newfound power. They know they have access to information. So again, what can we do as marketers? What we need to do is look at those data sets and find ways of creating hyper-relevant content, engaging in content, to again go back to that consumer decision journey 
that consider, evaluate, buy, and advocate, and find ways of engaging with consumers along that journey so we can help shape their behavior. That's the second principle. The last principle is seamless experiences. Consumers want us, as marketers, as brands, to help them create less friction between all of the different devices they're using, all of the different channels that they're interacting with, and then across mobile payment or across payments themselves. So when you look at devices, we know, and this is no surprise, people have multiple devices and they're multitasking on them. But what we also know is that that's creating a higher demand for integration. They're looking for us as brands to deliver content in an integrated way across those many devices. And in fact, I loved hearing about what Mark is doing in terms of he doesn't even want to look at things unless he can see it on a mobile device because if it doesn't work there, then it can't work anywhere else. And so that's the devices. In terms of the channels, we know that 83% of consumers would actually pick a brand if that brand is better at helping them navigate through the physical dimension, so the store, the digital dimension, an e-commerce site, and then also the mobile experience. And so if you're a brand and you can do that well for a consumer, they're more prone to choose you. And then last, in terms of the payment methods, we also know that consumers are looking for simplification there. They're asking the payment brands to remove the friction that they have in terms of conducting transactions across those different dimensions. And in fact, a recent study showed that in India, I think it's Brazil and China, 75% of consumers say they would prefer to just consolidate all of their transactions onto one device. And of course, that device is mobile. So what can we do as marketers? Again, what we need to do is understand that consumers are looking for an integrated, holistic, seamless, and optimized experience across the channels, the devices, and then ultimately the forms of payment. So those are the three principles. What I wanted to also show you is how we're taking those principle, the principles of that future state and applying them to how we market to consumers today. And I thought a good example of that would be how we activated the London 2012 Olympics. So let me start with the first pr principle, people powered. The entire campaign is based on this insight that consumers, well actually fans, fans really do believe that they can fuel an athlete's performance. So just think for a minute the last time that you were watching something on television or your device, you're actually watching it live in person, and you're stomping, you're cheering, you're clapping, you're yelling, it's because you think that you can will that goal to happen or you can will that athlete to even higher heights. Well, that insight was what we based our entire campaign on, where we invited consumers into a global cheer to actually fuel the Olympic Games. And so this first piece of film is how we invited consumers into that global conversation. When you wish. Third attempt at a new world record. They fly just a little bit higher. Bob is 22 years old. When you scream. Going down the they go the just a little bit further. The crowd, as you can hear, when you hold your breath. Well. They can even be perfect. And when we come together to cheer as one, <laughs> we know what happens. Visa, proud sponsor of the Olympic Games for 25 years. Join our global cheer. The second principle is intelligent communications, and this is related to what Stuart also shared with you in terms of moment marketing. We know that we need to provide more relevant, more timely, uh, more engaging content to consumers. And so what we did during the Olympics is we used people's social graphs to actually customize uh, the content that we delivered and to optimize the rotation of that content based on what consumers were talking about across their social graphs. Um, obviously working with our partners like Facebook and Twitter <laughs> and Google to do that. Um, we then actually wanted to try and provide that moment marketing, sort of real-time um, marketing and messaging to consumers. And so what we did is we actually took film as it was happening. So as an at athlete scored or medaled, we would take that film and working with our partners at OMD and TBWA, we would insert that into a film template, if you will, and we would get 
a real moment from the Olympics on air in the US within four hours. And so consumers not only were surprised, but they were incredibly engaged because of the relevancy and the timeliness of that particular piece of content. And so here's an example of that. This is um, a piece of film that we created using real footage from Michael Phelps' 19th medal win when he won um, or became the most awarded Olympian in all time. Michael Phelps brought the world to its feet in 2004. Eight years and 19 medals later, the world hasn't stopped cheering yet. You just became the most decorated Olympian in history. Congratulations, Michael, from all of us. Visa, supporting athletes and the Olympic Games for 25 years. Join our global cheer. And then again, to reinforce the people powered, all of that imagery at the end, that's real fans, and they had submitted their own shares um, via our um, Facebook platform. And so last, I just want to underscore the importance of the, the third principle, which is seamless experiences. And so as the principle said, we really worked very hard to integrate all of the different touch points. So whether it be across the devices or across the channels that we were using to communicate with consumers, everything had to tie together from uh, someone who's sitting in a chair, interacting with us through a device or through a traditional um, television uh, experience, all the way to those people who are actually on the ground at the Olympics themselves. And so this is just a, a, a recap of the entire campaign and the results that we generated for the business overall. In 2008 and 2010, Visa cheered on the world. In 2012, we got the whole world cheering along with us. We created a campaign that was truly global, empowering fans to fuel athlete performance like never before. We asked people everywhere to join the global cheer, and they did. Showing their support with inspirational messages, photos and videos, with tweets and posts and likes, and by watching and sharing our content. All actions that we called cheers. And we got over 60 million of them. With more than 70 countries and nearly 1,000 financial institutions and merchant partners activating the campaign. A massive on-the-ground presence in London. Fans traveling to the event from foreign countries spent over $1.9 billion on their visa cards during the three weeks of the games. We produced over 80 commercials in 18 languages, each telling the kind of story the Go World is famous for. We told stories that crossed borders and boundaries. We told stories of triumph, stories of overcoming the odds, stories that celebrated the athletes and people around the world cheering for them, and real-time stories that celebrated events as they happened and some of the real cheers of real fans we collected online. People everywhere were amazed and inspired, and they helped make this not just the most social and global Olympic campaign ever, but the most successful Go World ever. Visa showed a significant increase in key brand metrics, saw the largest gain in online conversation, and got approximately 50 million views on YouTube. Inspired by more than 1,500 stories and articles around the world, generating over 206 million impressions. Visa was the leader among top sponsors in marketing leadership message poll throughout the games. And most importantly, Go World made people want to use Visa more. And not just at the games, but everywhere, seeing a 13% increase in claimed past month usage around the world. All reaffirming that the Olympics partnership drives Visa's business and the business of its clients. Visa, a proud sponsor of the Olympic Games for 25 years, asks the world to cheer. And the response was deafening. So that is Omnicommerce and the principles applied to today. Thank you.